Hey fam! So today we're talking about the regular FG module of some group G. You need to specify your field as well, but that's just going to be R or C, so we're not going to worry about that too much. Really the main thing you need to give me is G, and I can construct for you its regular FG module. And of course, once we have an FG module, we can pick a basis and that gives us a representation. And we call that the regular representation of G over some field F. We'll get to that later. But the point is, you give me a G, I'm going to show you today a way to construct an FG module and a representation of that group. So like I was saying, you give me a group and some field, usually R or C, and then we let our vector space be the group algebra FG. Right? This is a vector space with a product, but for an FG module, we just need a vector space. Then if you let that G, the same G, act on the vector space of G with a group product exactly as expected by the structure of V, we have group elements commuting with scalars, etc. then FG comma G is called the regular FG module, right? FG is our vector space, our group algebra gives us a vector space, right? An FG module needs a linear closed group action, we get that from the one G that you give me, and it needs a vector space to act on, well that vector space is generated by that same G, so you just have to give me a G, I can use that G to make a vector space, I can use that same G to make a group action, so we call that the regular FG module, because all you need to give me is G. Sure, we need a field, but we're not really going to worry about that too much. And we're able to come up with an FG module, or if you prefer, uh, a representation of G. Give me G, I'll give you a representation and an FG module. Now, note that the dimension of our vector space is the order of the group. So the dimension of the vector space can get big fast, and that is really the main issue of working with the regular representation of a group over some field F. So that's pretty cool. You give me a group, I can use that group to make a vector space and a group action on that vector space, so I can use a group to generate its own FG module. But let's see an example. It becomes really clear if we have an example. So let our field be the complex numbers. Let our group be the cyclic group of order three. So G is just generated by one single element of order order three. So we can use this group to generate our vector space. What is the vector space? It's the group algebra FG. So our vector space is the group algebra FG, or specifically CC3. This is our vector space. It's also group algebra, but what we need it for is the, its vector space properties. And recall that for a group algebra, our basis vectors are the group elements, and they're just scaled by elements of our field. I indexed the components, if you will, by the group element that they're scaling. So lambda e, lambda a, lambda a squared, these are just complex numbers. And there's one for each element in our group. Okay, so here's what I mean by using the structure of our vector space and our group, which is all just our group product. We can define our action like this. Well, the identity, what does it do? We know that it just leaves everything alone. Remember this e is from our group as a group action. Right? This is coming from our group action, but we know how it operates if we think of it as an element of our group algebra. Right? It commutes with scalars, so we can pull the scalars out, it distributes over products, right? We have that property from our group algebra. So if we distribute it out, everything stays the same. But keep in mind that this is coming from the group action, even though we define its properties from the group algebra. Right? There's a lot of copies of the group here, so it's important to keep things straight. This guy lives in FG, this guy is just G acting on FG. So now we look at how A acts on a general element of our vector space C, C3. Well, if we multiply it out, we get this. And so if we rearrange it so that we have E, A, A squared, then we can see it basically just moves the scalars around. That's what this does. And then similarly for our element A squared, how does it act on an element from our vector space? Well, again, it just kind of moves things around. So all of this information gives us the regular C, C3 module, right? We have elements of our vector space. We know they look like this and we know how the group acts on our vector space. So we have a group action. We have a vector space that gives us an FG module, in this case, the regular C, C3 module. Consider the regular C, C3 module, right? The guy we just looked at in the last example, and let this map B map from our vector space, which is the group algebra, C, C3, to R3, the vector space R3, and let B be a vector isomorphism, such that we map our basis elements to these basis elements of R3. And then we extend B linearly, so we know what it does to the basis elements, and then we can just pull out scalars from here, right? We're just saying it's linear. Recall that this is the natural basis for our vector space. It's a natural basis, I mean, you could rearrange these guys, but this, to me, is the one that makes sense. Just reminding you of some terminology. Then we know how the group acts on our vector space, we saw that in the last example, but once you pick a basis, a linear action, which we know that our group action is, can be written as a matrix. So we can map G, our group action, to a set of matrices. And that can get a little confusing, but I'll come back to that in a second. 
So under this basis, we map E as a group action to the identity. So far so good. I'll tell you where I found this in just a second. A gets mapped to this guy and A squared gets mapped to this guy. Isn't that a little confusing? Because I just told you that our basis maps the identity to this guy. It maps A to this guy, maps A squared to this guy. These guys are vectors. These guys are matrices. We're saying that our map sends E to this guy and E to this guy. Like what, what the hell is going on? But we have to remember that G generates our vector space and our action. So we have two copies of G that we're working with for the regular FG module. We are now constructing our, the regular FG module of some group G over F. And I'm skipping to the punchline a little by saying that. But this is important to remember, right? We have two copies of the group. It's the vector space and it's also generating an action on that vector space. So we need to know how our basis maps the vectors, but also how it maps the action. But if we can wrap our heads around that, we can generalize this. So we note that the, possibly a, natural basis map on the regular FG module of some field and some group gives us a representation of G known as the regular representation of G over F, right? I've mentioned this before. How did I find these though? What I did is I looked at these and I applied the map. I think it'd be worth doing a little example of this. Let me grab a notebook. Okay, so I'm writing this out rather quickly. Usually I prepare my notes, so please excuse the messiness. But we know that a general element of our vector space, in this case CC3, looks like this. And we know that the action of A looks like this. So then under our basis mapping, we end up finding that a general element looks like this. These numbers become the components of a vector because we picked a basis that makes sense. This is just 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Hopefully getting from here to here makes sense because under this map, we just plug these guys in for our basis vectors and we get an element of R3. So we do the same thing over here and we find that after A is acted on it, we get this guy. Well, we know that our basis mapping is a homomorphism. So the product after mapping has to be the product before mapping. How do I know it's a homomorphism? Because the basis mapping we proved before gives us a representation and part of that was proving that it was a homomorphism. So that was proved in an earlier video. So we have that the product before mapping has to be equal to the product after mapping. If we write this stuff in, then we have that this vector has to be equal to this matrix times a vector. How do I know this is a matrix? Again, because this is a linear action. Linear actions under a basis give us a matrix. I just thought about it. Like if I look for the first row of this guy and multiply these guys with the first row, I need a squared to survive and the other two to be zero. So I know that it's gonna be zero, zero, one for the first row, right? Because of the way that vectors multiply with matrices. And for the second row, it's gotta be one, zero, zero. Cause the E squared has to survive when I multiply it and the other two have to be zero. And then when I multiply it with the third row, I need A to survive, so it's gonna be zero, one, zero. And if we come back over here, that's exactly what we find. So that's how I found these guys. That's how you're gonna find the regular representation of a group over a field once you've constructed the regular FG module so FG modules representations have these different properties that we can check for. One of them is faithful. So let's see if the regular FG module and its related representation is actually faithful. So recall that an FG module is faithful means that if there is a group element that acts on a vector and gives you back that vector for all vectors, right? So this group element can act on any vector and it always gives you back the same vector. That is true if and only if the only group element that does that is the identity. So if an FG module is faithful, the only element that leaves all vectors unchanged must be the identity element. So let's check if this is true for the regular FG module. Let's start with the right hand side. Start over here, this is easy. Well, if G is equal to the identity element, then we have that G acting on V, well, this is just the identity acting on V, just gives us back V. This, the identity element always acts like this for an FG module regardless of anything. So the right hand side implies the left hand side. Easy. So then let's call the order of our group N. That's what we usually do. Then take some guy from our vector space, right? Our FG module. And we know it's gonna have the form like this, right? It's just gonna be some linear combination of our group elements scaled by some amount. I'm gonna leave out the sigma and we're gonna know that because there's two indices, that implies a sum. That's the Einstein summation convention. So now let's start with the left-hand side. Let's suppose that there is some group element that leaves all of our Vs unchanged. All vectors, when acted on by this group element, are left unchanged. Then let our vector be equal to S, because we know they're all gonna have that form, so that just gives us something to work with. We have that G acts on S. We know it acts linearly. So remember this is a sum, but term by term, we can just pull out all of these scalars. So again, this is still a sum, but term by term, we have these group elements 
multiplying with each other. But we're supposing that this group action leaves the vector unchanged. So here's the group action acting on that vector. And we're saying that's equal to the original vector. Well, if that's true, term by term, these are going to be our basis vectors. So these need to be the same. Or all of these guys are zero, but that's trivial. So if these are the same term by term for each i, pick one of them, and we can multiply by the inverse of gi on the right on both sides of this equation. So this just becomes the identity for every single individual term, right, because this is a sum, and we have that the group is equal to the identity term by term. We just have the same equation over and over. We have i equations that all say that our group element has to be equal to the identity. So that tells us that our group element has to be the identity if we're working with the regular FG module, if we start by supposing that there is some group element that leaves all vectors unchanged. So then we have that the left-hand side implies the right-hand side. So both sides imply each other, so we see that the regular FG module is indeed faithful. The regular representation of G over F is also faithful because representations and their corresponding FG modules are the same thing, QED. Uh. And I'm gonna leave you with a fun fact. You can also let any element of your group algebra, right? A group algebra is a vector space with some product on it. Act on any element of an FG module. So we are in some sense taking an FG module, right? It's some vector space and a group action and linearly extending that action of G. So then we have elements of FG, our group action, acting on our vector space. So we've upgraded our FG module to be able to handle linear combinations of actions. So if we let R be some guy in our group action, then we know that R is of this form, right? This is a sum, keep in mind. We're summing over all the group elements in our group, right? This is a linear combination. And then if we have some vector in our vector space, which is Fn, right, our FG module is a vector space with a group action. It knows how each of these individual group elements acts on a vector. Well, we just extend it linearly exactly as you would expect. So we have R times V. Well, that's just equal to this element of FG, right? This guy lives in our group algebra and it acts on a vector. Recall that this is a sum, right? I just wrote it out to be a little more explicit and let each of the individual group elements act on a vector. This is gonna be a vector back in our vector space, vector back in our vector space. We know how to sum this all up. So we know how to let FG act on our FG module. So again, we have now upgraded our abilities with FG modules to let linear combinations of group actions act on our vectors. And I think that's kind of neat. Thanks for watching, guys. The next video is going to be a bunch of examples just to make this stuff clear. It's actually really straightforward once you do a couple of examples. And I'm sure if there's anything that's not clear for you right now, then the examples are going to clear things right up. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.